Speak to our hearts, speak to our minds, transform us in Jesus' name, amen. Everybody say transform. transform. Because this morning, I want to move more out of the dasco of the word, the teaching of the word, more into Caruso. My prayer for you this morning is that rather than receiving information, you would receive transformation. Uh, I believe that God wants to do a change in your mind, a change in your heart, and, 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 and change and a transformation in this church as well. So let's pray again, specifically asking for that. Father, in Jesus' name, we ask your Holy Spirit to move. And as individuals, Lord, I say, move in me and transform me. And if that's your prayer, just whisper, amen. Father, speak to my heart, wash my mind and heart with the water of the word. I ask you to speak to me specifically in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, prior to me going to this Pentecostal Holiness Conference, I felt like I was getting a little bit depressed about the direction the church is going and several things that were going on in my life. And I asked the Lord to speak to me, and he wound up identifying for me some of the things I'm going to share with you this morning. So the reason I say that is I want you to be aware that what I'm sharing with you is coming out of what the Holy Spirit had to share with me and correct me on personally so that I would move from one place to another place. As we know, according to Luke chapter 17, in the last days, how many believe we're in the last days and Jesus is coming soon? Say amen. amen. Okay. In the last days, it's going to be like it was in the days of Noah and Lot. Now, this talks about the world. This is what's going to be happening to the world around us. It is going to be wicked like it was in the days of Noah, where man's thoughts were perverse and wicked. And that is exactly what we see happening in the world, correct? Also, it's going to be like it was in the days of Lot, where that kind of perversion is going to grip a hold of, and not only is that perversion going to have a grip on the people of the world, but who was in charge of Sodom? It wasn't Lot, it was these guys. And you are going to see uh, if Jesus is correct, and how many believe he is, that the power, that the authority is going to be corrupt, that it's going to be perverse. And we're seeing emerging in the news on almost a daily basis an exposure of how sexually perverse members of the government and those in powers are. How many say, yeah, you, you bet, that's exactly what we're seeing. <laughs> and that's what Jesus said was going to happen. Now this morning... I want to talk a little bit about what Jesus said was going to happen to the church. That's the bride of Christ itself. And that includes us. We are, Calvary Church of the Islands is part of the church, the ecclesia in general. Ecclesia, the church means all existent believers who are living on earth, who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved by his blood. That's the ecclesia, that's the church. And to the church in general, he says, uh, uh, in Revelation chapter 1, 2, and 3, he identifies what we understand to be the church ages. Now, there are some theologians who would disagree, and there are some theologians who would tell you that the churches that Jesus is talking to John about at the beginning of Revelation, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and finally Laodicea, that these are just things that Jesus wanted John to tell the, the pastors of this church, and he wanted to send them letters. Well, logistically, there's a problem with that because he was in exile on Patmos. So John would be not the best choice logistically to send vital messages to the pastors of these churches because John is not guaranteed to be able to get those letters to them. Two, the entire body of the revelation that the Spirit of Jesus gives to John from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 22 all regards the end time eschatological theater and has to do with what is going to happen in the future in a very broad sense and with very, very broad strokes. That having been said, uh, 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 it is out of context for Jesus to take three whole chapters, which is the beginning of the book of Revelation, and devote that to a simple message that he wanted sent to the members or, or, or the pastors of, uh, of these seven churches. Uh, there are times 
when uh, 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 in the epistles, individual messages are given to people, but generally speaking, you'll see them at the end of the epistle, and they're very, very short. This grinds up an entire three chapters of the first initial presentation, and this is the first thing that Jesus says to John, is let me talk to you about these seven churches. So I believe, we, I, I believe the same as D.L. Moody, I believe the same as Darby, I believe the same as uh, Clarence Larkin, and, and other prophets and teachers of the past, that what Jesus was describing here are the church ages. This is what is going to happen to my bride. From the time I leave until the time I return, you're going to see the church go through these transformations. And all I can tell you is this, whether that is right or not, and I think it is, there is no doubt in my mind that the church today is Laodicean. Now, what do I mean by Laodicean? I want you to turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. And we're going to take a look briefly at verses 14 through 22. Because this is the message that Jesus sends to the Laodicean church, which I believe we are in that church age. What is the age going to look like? Again, this is not the world. Those that do not know Jesus, they are going to be wicked and it is going to be, the, the, the world is going to be like it was in the days of Noah and like it was in the days of Lot. This talks about the church, the church age and what the church itself is going to be like. This is the way most people who believe in Jesus are going to be just before Jesus comes back. And he starts... And he says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, angel, angelos, messenger, uh, most theologians believe that this is a message specifically to the head of the church, that would be the pastor or, or, the, or the head head elder, that would be myself, but the message would not only be for me, but would also be for uh, uh, Richard, would also be for Daryl, would also be for Joe Lancor, uh, starting next week, also for Jose, it would be for the pastoral staff, and it would be for all of us. This is a message I'm giving you. To the church in Laodicea, right. These are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. That would be who? Jesus. And he starts in verse 15 with this. I know. I know your deeds. This is something that Jesus is revealing in terms of how he sees it, how he feels, what he thinks. And he says, I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish. Say that with me. I wish. One more time. I wish. This is what Jesus wishes. When he looks at the church of today, when he looks at the Laodicean church, this is what he wishes. This is what he wants. Now, if we are dedicated to serving the Lord, then paramount in our mind is going to be to identify what is it that God wants from us. What is it that God sees? What is it that Jesus sees? And what is it that he wants? I wish, he says. That you are neither that you are neither hot, cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now I told the 830 church, me personally, I don't understand that. If I'm gonna take a shower, I want it to be a hot shower. But if I can't have a hot shower, I would rather have lukewarm than cold. What is being discussed here? are people's attitudes, people's hearts, and people's mindsets. Hot, you know what the Lord wants you to do, and you do it. With all your mind, all your heart, and all your strength, you are all in. If you are cold, what cold means is you don't know. You have no idea what God wants. You have no idea what God uh, thinks. You have no idea what God feels. You are stone cold. Lukewarm means this. You know what God wants. You know what he has said. I want you to praise me. I want you to thank me. I want you to worship me with all your heart and with all your soul. I want you to dedicate your heart and your mind to me. I want you to give me everything. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. I want to fill you with the power of my Holy Spirit. I want my blood running through you. I want you ministering to every single person around you. For the people that are already Christian, I want you to help disciple them, bless them, lay hands on them when they need healing. Pray for deliverance when there's a demonic problem. 
but I want you ministering to these people with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength when it comes to those who are pre-Christian. I want you sharing the message of the gospel. And hot Christians know all that and they do it. If you're stone cold, you have no idea what you're supposed to do and you're not doing anything. If you are lukewarm, you know the things you're supposed to be doing. You're just not. There is a mixture, and it's kind of like a child, you know? Uh, 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 a child, you would rather, if, if, they're not do, if they're not cleaning their room, if they're not sweeping the driveway, if they're not helping take out the trash, if they're not helping wash the dishes, but they've been never taught how to do this stuff. They don't know how to do it. They're too young. They can't reach the sink, whatever it is. You know, that's different than an older child who knows how to wash dishes, who knows how to sweep the driveway, who knows how to take out the rubbish, who knows how to pick up a room, who knows how to do laundry, who understands all this and instead just lets their mother do it anyway. Fully aware of how hard it is, fully aware how difficult it is, but just lets their mother, her mother or his mother do it for them and does not lift one finger to help. That is lukewarm. That is different. That is uncaring. They do not give a rip about the impact on anybody else. Instead, all they're caring about is their own comfort and what serves them, what suits them, and where their comfort zone is. That's lukewarm. And that, Jesus said, is going to be the way the church is, the bride is. And somebody say, praise God for his mercy and his grace. And the reason I mean that is because Kaleo, this is the church he comes back for. Jesus knew in the end times the church was going to be Laodicean and this is the church he comes back for anyway because we are sanctified and saved by his blood and his grace and his mercy, amen? This deals with something else. This has, this has to do with God's will and what Jesus wants from his church. He says, because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. The venom in Jesus towards the Laodicean church comes because he's aware. They know the right thing to do. They just don't feel like doing it anymore because they're surrounded by this atmosphere in the world that is like the days of Noah and like the days of Lot and there's so much wickedness and culture just slides so much in morality and they become depressed because they can't make any headway. Now during the days of the church of Philadelphia, this was the boom era of the church from 1900 and on. This was kind of like the church of Philadelphia where people loved ministers and they loved churches. The reason that this church is here was built in the 1940s is because in those days when Kailua Assembly of God bought this property, neighborhoods wanted a church in their neighborhood. It made property values go up to have a church in the neighborhood. And everybody saw a church coming in uh, and being built, and they thought, yay, absolutely. And everybody in the neighborhood gathered around and tried to see what they could do to help the church. And when the church opened up, people in the neighborhood wanted to attend the church that was right by them, and they were excited about it. Now what do you think the atmosphere is? If they could get rid of every single church in Kailua, believe me, if Cynthia Thielen could get rid of every church in this town, she would. Because the world hates the church now, and they do not want churches here. And I will tell you, Department Land Utilization is doing every single little trick and thing they can possibly do to make churches feel as unwelcome as possible. The point I'm trying to make is this, not grouse about city or state government, but to inform you, that is the way the world is. And we see that and we have a hard time making any inroads or any progress. We don't have the same impact we do. When my pastor used to go around the town and tell people that he pastored Calvary Church to the coastlands, in the 70s and in the 80s, they would go, oh, really, you're a pastor? Oh, excuse me, Reverend, you know, what can I do? Now, when I identify myself as a pastor... What do you do for a living? Oh, I pastor a church. They go, oh, really? You're a pastor? Oh. The attitude has changed now. The world does not like the church. The world hates Jesus. And by the way, that's fine because Jesus said, if the world hates me, it's going to hate you. It's the world's supposed to hate me. 
if it hates Jesus. Whoever hates Jesus out there is supposed to hate me. I'm fine with that. That's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about the attitude within the church itself where you are one of the people who wants to burn bright for the Lord. I want to pray. I want to attend church. I don't want to miss a single service. I want to worship with all my heart. And I want to worship with all my soul. And I want to glorify God. And Josh is up there pouring his heart out. There's the girls singing their hearts out. There's Jojo pounding the drums like a pro. And there's Arvin playing the bass. And you want to worship God and you turn around and look at your neighbor who's sitting there like this on a device. It is discouraging. It is depressing. And it's something that makes you feel like you just want to give up and you don't want to be a part of it. The Laodicean church, this is how it's defined. Look at verse 17. You say, I've ri- I'm rich, I've acquired wealth, I don't need a thing. But you don't realize you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I do not need a thing. I don't need anything. That is the definition of Laodicean church. I don't need God. I don't need church. I don't need to go Wednesday. I don't need to go Sunday. I don't need to serve. I don't need to pray. When people are looking for somebody to help out at the church, I don't need to do that. When they're looking for somebody to help set up the tables so on, on Wednesday or, on, or Sunday, I don't need to be there for that. When they're looking for somebody to help clean up the church on Saturday, I don't need to help out for that. Uh, when, when you know worship starts at 8.30 or 10 o'clock, I don't need to be there on time. And any excuse is sufficient in the Laodicean's mind to avoid doing something for God because they don't need God. They don't need God for anything. They find their fulfillment in their device. They find their fulfillment in their human relationships. They find their fulfillment on TV, on a computer. And they build themselves a life that basically does not need God, does not need the fellowship of God, and does not need the fellowship of the fellow believers. They don't need God, don't need church, don't need any of it. That, in essence, is the Laodicean church. And the way they respond to God in prayer, the way they respond to God in in praise, the way they respond to God in worship, the way they thank him, the way their attitude is in their heart is, reflects this I don't need mentality. Jesus has a response to that. I counsel you. Jesus counseling you as an individual. As a Christian living in this Laodicean age where you are going to be tempted to throw in with and become a part of the Laodicean church because it seems to you as though everybody around you is too. Now I want to tell you something. That's where I was headed. And as I am emerging from the Foursquare Church and, and becoming interested in starting to join the Pentecostal Holiness Church, Kaleo, there's one thing that's in common with both denominations. And I happen to know from my brothers in the Assemblies of God because I play golf with Dan Preciado down the road and I know him well too. The Assemblies of God is having the same thing. The number one complaint, the number one fear that senior pastors have, guys like me that are in charge of the entire church, is not that there's an intrusion of paganism, not an intrusion of heathenism. In fact, our worries and our concerns have nothing to do with what's outside the building anymore. It is now one and the same thing with every single pastor I know. Their their fear is apathy. The people in the church that they pastor, that attend their church, just don't give a rip could care less who's preaching on Sunday, could care less what song is playing. They're not involved anyway. And globally across the land, the cry of pastors to God are, my people are apathetic, my people don't care. And furthermore, there's nothing I can do about it. I've been preaching my heart out, I've been praying, I've been worshiping, I've been crying out to God, and the people are just apathetic and you know, to all these guys, I just shrug and go, look, that's what Jesus said it was going to be like. But, and there's a big but. Number one, there's an answer from Jesus. He says, I counsel you to buy gold from me. Buy gold. You know what the word buy means? You sacrifice, you pay. 
Be willing to pay the price for holiness. Be willing to pay the emotional and intellectual price that even though everybody around me is not worshiping, I will. Even, even though everybody around me is not praying, I will. If nobody else in my family wants to go on Wednesday night, I am going to be there. And not so much because of what I get out of it, but because I want to serve. I want to be an active part of this church that you, Lord, have sent me to. I want to tithe. I want to financially support. I, my heart is on fire. I want to serve God because I know this is God's will in my life concerning me. And I'm not doing it to please Pastor Wendell. I'm not doing it to please anybody around. I don't care who knows what I give or what I do. In fact, I'd rather nobody know. But I know whose eye is upon me. His eye is on the sparrow and his eye is also on you and also on me. And at the end of the day, I want to make decisions that are pleasing to him. And this is what he says, I wish you were hot or cold, not lukewarm. That's not what I want. I not only counsel you to buy from me gold refined in fire, but to get white clothes. Now, white clothes are a symbol of what people see. When people see you, what do they see? Somebody who's depressed? Somebody who's given up? Somebody who doesn't give a rip about Jesus? Or they, do they see somebody who is not only on fire for the Lord, but wants to set everybody else on fire as well? I'll tell you what, you can have, because Matt and I, we are guys that do uh, a barbecue all the time. And anybody who has experienced with, experience with barbecue will tell you, all you have to do is set one coal in that brazier, burning white hot, and eventually all of it will burn. Well, I want to be that coal. I want to be that flame. I don't want to be one of the cold black ones. I want to be one of the hot white ones. I not only want to be set on fire by the Holy Spirit, but I want to be somebody who helps set others on fire as well. Now, if you say amen to that, you are not Laodicean. And here's the thing. Question for you this morning, question that God asked me is, what church are you the pastor of? What kind of Christian are you? Are you a Laodicean or are you a true believer? Are you a true Christian? And by the way, let me say this. There are four different levels of involvement with Jesus. A believer, that's somebody who believes Jesus has died on the cross, paid for his sins, and rose again three days later. How many are believers? Say amen. Amen. Number, level number two is a disciple. That is somebody who wants to learn about Jesus and follow Jesus. I am willing to abandon what the world has taught me. I want to get rid of all that in my head and my heart, and I want to learn what Jesus wants, and I want to learn what Jesus desires and has said. If you're one of those, you're a disciple. Level three, Christian. I not only want to follow Jesus and learn about Jesus, I want to be transformed and I want to be like him. Level four, apostle. Somebody who, because of the transformation in their life, now God has chosen and said, I am sending you and I want you to go do this. And you are going to have a specific authority and a talent uh, matrix that I'm going to give you that will enable you to perform and do awesome transformative, transformative change, transformational change in this area. That's an apostle. And those are the four different levels. That hasn't been said. You know what, Sandra? I'm going to tell you something. And this is my opinion. This is the opinion of your pastor. I don't believe Laodicean people are Christian. And I'll tell you why. Because I don't believe by definition they want to be like Jesus. They want Jesus to be like them. They want their comfort level. They want their definitions of Scripture and of God's word and will and way to suit them, not the other way around. A Christian wants to be like Jesus. A Christian wants to abandon self and become like Jesus. And I don't believe Laodiceans are Christian. They're believers. They're going to heaven, praise God. But I don't believe they're Christian. Put salve in your eyes so you can see spiritually clearly. Jesus goes on to say, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So I don't mind being rebuked and disciplined by the Lord. I had to be. Be earnest and repent. Now, here are two things I want to share with you. I stand at the door and knock, he says, and if anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he will me. He with me. Now look, 
in these last days, in the midst of the Laodicean church, there is a promise here. And oftentimes, Tony, this line is quoted to every believer. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody opens the door, I'll come in and eat with him. And they apply that to every believer. That is not meant to every believer. That is theologically inaccurate. This is a promise that is specifically given to those who overcome the Laodicean problem. This is specific. This is not for everybody. This is not for every believer and is not meant to have global application, nor what is next. Read it. To him who overcomes, verse 21, seven plus seven plus seven, if you guys are into numerology, I am somewhat. To him who overcomes, I will give him the right. Who? So is this a promise? Fallon, is this a promise to the whole church as a generic thing, or is this something spoken as Jesus to an individual? This is something to you. This is something that Jesus is speaking to you, something that Jesus is speaking to me, something that Jesus is speaking to Patty, to, to, to Daryl, to Kai Kai. He who overcomes. And why is there this individuality here? Because he knows in the Laodicean church era, he may have to deal with and bless just individuals because large groups of people are going to have a very hard time moving from the Laodicean mode into the hot mode to overcome. He who overcomes, I will give the right to sit down with me on my throne. Not everybody, La Hella, gets to sit on the throne with Jesus when they get to heaven. You'll get to heaven, okay? And that's the way a lot of uh, 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 Laodiceans are. You know what? All I care about is when I die, I go to heaven. That's enough for me. That's enough. Well, it's not enough for me. Look up at me now for just a second without taking any notes. Because I want to share something with you as your pastor and the pastor of Calvary Church of the Islands. That is not enough for me. It is not enough that you know Jesus and are going to heaven. You're going to go to heaven when you die. That's not enough. I want to be pleasing to Jesus. I want the smile of God upon my life. I want the presence of God in my mind and my heart. It is not enough for me, Wendell Choi, to just know I'm going to go to heaven because my sins are forgiven when I die and I'm going to enter the pearly gates. I want Jesus to hug me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to sit on the throne with him. I want to ride next to him when he comes back for his own. I want to be close. I want to be pleasing to him. I want to be known as a servant of his. I want to be pleasing to him now so that I can be more pleasing to him later. And as the pastor of this church, I am never going to be okay with the church being tepid and lukewarm. I am always going to fight to pull, haul, cajole, prod, whatever it is I have to do for you to be pleasing to God, serve God, and walk in his presence deeper and better than ever before. And if that is not what you're into, you need to find another church. You will be happier someplace else. There are churches out there that will serve your needs and make you feel more comfortable than you will be here. Because here, there are times when I'm going to make you uncomfortable because I'm constantly going to be challenging you to walk closer and closer and closer and give God more and more and more because I am morally more concerned about making God happy and pleasing him and being pleasing to the Lord and fulfilling this call that Jesus gives us, the Laodicean church. I wish... Now, for me, as I see this, and let me just finish with this thought. In Numbers 13, I'm going to take five extra minutes here. I apologize. Moses wants to invade Canaan, the promised land. And he sends 12 men, one from each tribe. And he says, I want you to go scout out the land and come back and tell me what you think. And 10 of them go and say this. We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. 
And they spread among the Israelites an evil report about the land that they had explored. They said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there, all the people, really all the people? All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, honestly. You're talking about the angels that left heaven and mated with women, their children were there. That's who you saw in the land of Canaan. They're exaggerating now because they're being dysphemistic. We can't attack them. Really, you can't attack them? What you mean is you don't think you can prevail. Nothing stops you from attacking. You want to attack, you can attack. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win, but if you want to attack them, you can. But they're saying we can't attack. We can't even attack. The Nephilim are there. They're giants. They're going to say this. They say, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we look the same to them. How the heck do you know what you look like to them? Are you them? You don't have, you have no idea what you look like to them. You were hiding all the time. They didn't see you anyway. You were spies. But here's the thing. There were two, Joshua and Caleb, that come out and say, if the Lord is for us, who can, who can be against us? If God has given us the land, we should rise up and attack and all these people, regardless of how big they are and how bad they are, they're food for us. They stood up and they said, we don't care, we win or lose. We think we're gonna win because God is, God is with us and God has anointed us. But even if we don't, if God has said, invade the land, we're gonna invade, we're gonna do what we have been called to do. You being in the Laodicean church and being surrounded by Laodicean people, here's, here's the thing. You're gonna have a whole bunch of guys looking around in your family. Oh, everything sucks. Everything's horrible. Everything's terrible. I hate all this. You're gonna have people in your church. You know, it's just not the way it used to be. And, you know, it's not as exciting as it was. And I don't know, it's just lost something for me. And, you know, I'm depressed and I'm frustrated. And, and you, that is the Laodicean voice. That's the 10. And the reason they speak like that is they're focusing on the things that Satan is doing, not the things that God is doing. And that's exactly what I was doing. I was focusing on all oh, the church isn't growing and this isn't happening. We don't have much money. And I, 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 on and on and on and on and on. And I cried out to God. I said, God, I need you to help me. And he showed me all of this and I realized, of course the church is going to be Laodicean. You're Laodicean. Your heart, your mind is Laodicean. What else do you expect? The anointing comes from the top down. You are living in Laodicea. And I, your pastor, had to repent and I had to move. I had to emotionally and intellectually move house and realize, Lord, you need to put salve in my eyes so I could see. And the second I prayed that, you know what I wound up seeing? I started seeing different people and started seeing different pockets of people in the church. He started showing me how God is moving in couples like Micah and, 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 and Gabby and how he's transforming Jojo and how he's setting Joshua on fire and, and, and how he's transforming and Jose and he, he showed me different ones. And I will warn you, I'm a pastor. I have a pastor's anointing. I know if you are interested in transformation or not. I can tell. I know whether you care about God or not. I can tell. It is like a mother who is making dinner and a child coming up to them, talking to them while they're preparing the meal. That mother can tell if that child is hungry or not or does not care about the dinner or does not care for what's being cooked. The mother can tell in like manner. Pastors can tell when people are on fire for God or when they're in that Laodicean, I don't care, kind of place. As Christians, we are called to stand up for God, especially in this season and at this time. And for those who overcome, because Jesus knows this is difficult for two reasons, okay? Uh, in two ways, this is an internal problem. This is, number one, something where you have to overcome how you feel and how you think. 
Romans chapter 12 says that's the hardest thing to do is allow personal transformation. You may be praying all day long that things around you change. You may be praying all day long that people around you change. You may be thinking that that is the core and that is the heart and that's the answer is if my circumstances and my situation change, then I would be okay. I got news for you. That has nothing to do with transformation. Transformation is you changing. And number one, that's the hardest thing. Number two, it's internal because it is your brothers and sisters that surround you. It can be your family that is the most negative source. It can be your friends and your circle of friends that is the most negative, draining, kryptonite-like thing that you can possibly be exposed to. But even Superman starts cagging when there's green K around. Bad company corrupts good character. That's what the Bible says. And even though they are friends and even though they are family... They can also be living in Laodicea, and for the strongest Christian, this can be an issue. I encourage you today to rise up like David. Call it to the Holy Spirit and say, I don't want to live in Laodicea anymore. I want to be a Christian, not a Laodicean. David, when he was faced with insurmountable problems, and he saw a giant in the valley and everybody else around him was scared and everybody else around him was frightened and everybody else around him was running David went down and said if all I have is a slingshot and a rock I will fight if I die I die but that uncircumcised Philistine is not going to challenge the, armors, uh, the armies of the living God that's what David said and when, G- when Jesus sees those who stand up in the midst of the Laodicean church to praise and worship and pray and serve and be an active part, those people, he says, not only am I going to anoint them with a visitation from me, and that's what I want to see is a visitation of Jesus in this church and a visitation of Jesus in your life, I will sit down, come into your heart, and eat and dine with you. He's promising a type of intimacy and personal relationship with him that has never been offered to the church in history before. And two, that when you are in heaven, you will sit with him on his throne. What happens to you in heaven throughout all of eternity is designed and architected by you and your choices and decisions here. Now is the time to decide what you will be and what what you will receive. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, I invite you to ask yourself the question that I asked myself. Are you living in Laodicea? Are you allowing all the depression and all the negativity and all the evil reports to overcome you? 1 John 1, 8 and 9 says, if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That's what I had to do. I had to come to God and I had to say, Lord, I'm living in Laodicea. I need you to come get me. I need to come out and be separate. I want to stand up for you and burn hotter and brighter than I ever have, showing everybody around me the white garment that you put on me I love you, Lord. I serve you, God. I stand for your word. I stand for your will. I stand for your way. And I will not back down and equivocate. And if I have to go down into the valley alone with just a stone and a sling, I will fight. So on that day, when I see you face to face, you'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Here's your space on my throne. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person here. And if this is you, just lift your hands and whisper amen as I'm praying for you. Lord, I've been living in part or in whole. I've been living in Laodicea. Lord, please come get me. I don't want to be here anymore. I want to move house. I want to move in my mind and the way I think. I want to move in the way I feel and the way I'm driven. Come get me and deliver me. In Jesus' name.
I realize that this is sinful and you don't want me here. I don't want you spitting me out of your mouth, Lord. Instead, I want to be one of those that you are proud of, that you point down at on earth and say, all is not lost. Look at that one. I want to give you praise and I want to give you thanks. Now, Lord, in Jesus' name, we just rebuke an antichrist spirit that would keep us mired in the world and the mentality of the Laodicean. And in Jesus' name, Lord, I lift my hands and I say, I don't want to be a Laodicean anymore. I want to be a Christian. I want gold that I will buy from you. I want to have a white robe placed upon me. Put the, your salve in my eyes in Jesus' name that I might see in truth and in spirit. Now, Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask that you would give every single person here a fresh anointing of your presence. Now, God, that the fire would be rekindled, that it would be restored, that within their heart and within their mind, there would come a purifying flame of holiness, of resolve, of passionate love for you that will not be extinguished by the world or by the environment around them anymore, but instead will burn and overcome that we might be pleasing to you and we might give you what you wish. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. No. Nope.